Central banks are the new feudalism. All property is being concentrated into a few hands via fiat and zero interest. Serfdom is the end game. Central bankers were handed the Midas curse half a century ago. Midas turned everything that he touched into gold, even his own food. Exactly 50 years ago, the 15th of August 1971, central bankers were handed a much worse curse by Nixon. But instead of turning everything into gold, their curse was to turn all real assets, including gold, into worthless paper, creating the perfect setup for the central bank endgame. It matches Klaus Schwab's Great Reset agenda of, you will own nothing and will be happy. But it is not just central banks blowing bubbles. Because the whole world has become a bubble. It took 2,000 years to reach $100 trillion global debt and most of that has accumulated since 1971. Then 50 years later, global debt trebled to $300 trillion. I am projecting 2 quadrillions or more in the next 4 to 9 years. Sounds massive and sensational, but the math is simple. If we add unfunded liabilities of at least $200 trillion globally, plus total derivatives of at least 1.5 quadrillions, that takes us to 2 quadrillions. As the derivatives bubble explodes, or rather implodes in the next few years, as we hit the central bank endgame, all that money will be printed by central banks in a futile attempt to save the financial system. August 15, 1971 was the beginning of the end for the current economic era and currency system. The great financial crisis in 2006 was the start of the end of the end. In August 2019 when central banks panicked and stated they would do whatever it takes, the final stage of end of the end started. Regarding the World Economic Forum Great Reset Agenda you will own nothing and you will be happy. World Economic Forum. This motto set at all of our elite's overlords mindset. If you own nothing, someone else does. These someone else are our elite's overlords themselves and their corporate political minions. It will be a two-class society, no more middlemen, the middle class will be crushed. A hybrid, automated, technological, neo-feudal system. Something between ultra-crony capitalism on the uppers levels and a commie technological, Orwellian, nightmarish dystopia for the proles. Most people will own nothing and rent everything. The correct term is servitization. Indeed for surf loving their servitude. Proles will have UBI paid in the form of CBDC throughout their digital wallets. Those will be linked to their social credit, health, score. Cash money will be progressively outlawed. In this dystopia to come, privacy and nuclear family will no longer exist. Your ability to move freely will be reduced to absolute zero. No more human bounds, only human digits. Central bank digital currencies. Digital dollar, euro, and yuan will be implemented in the near future as a replacement for fiat. No more physical coins or bills. Helicopter money is the final play. They actually think they can keep inflation at bay because of the deflationary pressures caused by demographics. War is the final answer to introduce the reset and the new dollar. It's over. What is interesting is the return to pre-Western economics of the world when China dominated the flow. The optimum circumstance is an economically devastated Europe and the USA, which the collapse of the dollar will cause. Buy hard assets to preserve your wealth. That's why Bill Gates is buying farmland and BlackRock is buying houses, and everyone is buying gold. The gold derivatives market was ended to facilitate an explosion in gold prices needed for the new gold regime to anchor global trade. The solution? Decentralize the banks. Let every individual be their own bank. No more parasitic central banks with the power to print money. Individuals thrive through win-win cooperation and creating and contributing value to exchange. Welcome back to the Atlantis Report. You are here for your daily dose of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please take a second to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to also hit the notification bell. Thank you. With the stimulus checks long ago spent, Americans have gone back to buying things the old-fashioned way, on credit. Household debt surged by $313 billion in the second quarter to nearly $15 trillion, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York Household Debt and Credit Report. It was the biggest quarterly dollar increase in household debt since 2007. In percentage terms, household debt grew by 2.1%, the biggest surge since Q4 2013. 
Household debt includes mortgages, home equity loans, credit cards, auto loans, student loans, and other debt. With home prices rising, increasing mortgage debt was a big factor in the overall rise in indebtedness. Mortgage balances increased by $282 billion during the quarter. That represents a 2.8% rise from Q1 and a 6.7% year-over-year increase. The quarterly increase was the biggest since 2007 the cusp of the mortgage crisis. Outstanding mortgages now total $10.4 trillion. Seriously delinquent mortgage balances dropped to 0.47% of total balances, the lowest in the data going back to 2003. But forbearance for federally backed mortgages sweeps delinquency problems under the rug. At the end of Q2, there were still nearly 2 million mortgages in forbearance. We could see a huge spike in delinquencies and defaults when forbearance programs end this fall. Mortgages weren't the only source of increasing debt. Consumer spending made up over 70% of GDP in the second quarter. We now know that part of that went on plastic. Credit card balances rose 2.2% from Q1 to $787 billion. Including other sources of revolving credit pushed that number close to $1 trillion. A lot of Americans apparently used stimulus money to catch up on delinquent credit cards. Seriously delinquent balances fell to 9.3% of total balances. But despite the stimulus checks, 90-day-plus delinquencies remain higher than in the 2014-2019 range. Through the pandemic, Americans, by and large, kept their credit cards in their wallets and paid down balances. This is typical consumer behavior during an economic downturn. We saw small upticks in credit card balances in February and March but a sharp drop in April as stimulus checks rolled out. But as those stimmy checks ran out, Americans pulled the plastic out of their wallets. The mainstream media will spin this as good news, insisting that credit card spending is a sign the economy continues to improve. But that's not the only way to look at increased borrowing. You could conclude that since Americans have run out of stimulus money, they've been forced back to borrowing to keep up with ever-increasing prices. In other words, the sudden explosion in credit card spending could reveal consumer stress, not consumer confidence. Surging prices for both new and used cars pushed auto loan and lease balances higher by 2.4% in Q2. It was the biggest quarter-over-quarter -quarter percentage increase since 2016. Outstanding auto loans now total $1.42 trillion. With school out for the summer, student loan balances ticked down by $14 billion after a big jump in Q1. Student loan balances often drop in the second quarter. Even with the decrease, Americans still owe $1.57 trillion in student loan debt. That's up 1.9% from a year ago. The seriously delinquent rate in student loans dropped to 5.7% of total balances, but it wasn't because people suddenly started paying those balances. Many student loans were automatically entered into forbearance last spring, and they don't count as delinquent. Overall, the mainstream spun this debt report as overall positive. America's debt problems have been swept under the rug. Many consumers stopped making payments without negative consequences, even as free money hailed down upon them. Because delinquencies are no longer delinquencies but count as current, credit scores rose on average, and in the process, credit scores have become useless for banks to determine the creditworthiness of a potential borrower. After 16 months of sweeping this stuff under the rug, there is now a huge mess under the rug, and the temptation in government is to just keep it there and forget about it, or have the taxpayer clean it up, rather than consumers, lenders, and investors. Ultimately, the powers that be want Americans spending themselves deeper into debt. It's the only way they can prop up this economy. The Federal Reserve and the U.S. government have built a post-pandemic economic recovery on stimulus and debt. It is predicated on consumers spending stimulus money borrowed and handed out by the federal government or running up their own credit cards. But an economy built on debt isn't sustainable long-term. After posting a 10.4% increase in May, consumer debt continued to expand, growing by a record rate in June. Consumer credit grew by $37.69 billion in June, according to the latest data from the Federal Reserve. That represents a 10.6% increase. The Fed also revised the May number up from $35.3 billion to $36.6 billion. The big expansion in consumer credit was far above the $20.8 billion expected. 
Americans collectively owe $4.32 trillion in consumer debt. The Federal Reserve consumer debt figures include credit card debt, student loans, and auto loans but do not factor in mortgage debt. When you include mortgages, Americans are buried under nearly $15 trillion in debt. Revolving credit, primarily made up of credit card debt, rose by $17.9 billion in June, a whopping 22% increase. Americans now owe $992.2 billion in credit card debt. Consumer spending made up over 70% of GDP in the second quarter. It appears as stimulus checks ran out, Americans turned to plastic to continue their spending spree. As Reuters reported it, the surge in June could explain the sustained robustness in consumer spending during last quarter, even as the flow of stimulus money from the government ebbed. Through the pandemic, Americans, by and large, kept their credit cards in their wallets and paid down balances. This is typical consumer behavior during an economic downturn. Credit card balances were over $1 trillion when the pandemic began. We saw small upticks in credit card balances in February and March but a sharp drop in April as stimulus checks rolled out. The $28 billion-plus increase in May and June eclipsed anything we've seen since the pandemic began. Non-revolving credit, including auto and student loans, grew by $19.8 billion, a 7.2% increase. Even as credit card debt dropped during the pandemic, non-revolving credit continued to expand through last year and into 2021. Americans own more than $3.3 trillion in non-revolving debt. The Federal Reserve and the U.S. government have built a post-pandemic economic recovery on stimulus and debt. It is predicated on consumer spending stimulus money borrowed and handed out by the federal government or running up their own credit cards. Were it not for the Fed's easy money policy, consumers couldn't drive this borrow and spend economy. Obviously, if consumers were not able to borrow all this money, then they couldn't have spent it. They couldn't have bought all this stuff but for their ability to borrow money. And the only reason they can borrow money is because the Fed is supplying it. The Fed is making all this money available. It's holding interest rates artificially low so that people can pay the interest on all this money that they're borrowing. And that is what is helping to create a lot of these service sector jobs that would not exist but for the ability of Americans to go deeper into debt. This is precisely why the markets are trading on fantasy if they believe the central bank will actually tighten monetary policy. The bubble economy depends on air supplied by the Fed. If the Fed stops supplying that air, the whole thing is going to deflate. This was the Atlantis report. Please like, share, leave me a comment, subscribe, and please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I do upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. You will also find a PayPal link if you want to make a donation. Thank you wholeheartedly to all those of you who have already donated. Stay safe, sane, and healthy friends.